Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Little Face by Sophie Hanna. So this is like a thriller, I guess a psychological thriller. Sophie Hanna, I've read a number of her books now. Um, she's got her thrillers slash police procedurals. She's also the authorised writer to continue the Hercule Poirot series by the uh, Agatha Christie estate. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. She's only been gone two hours. Her husband David was meant to be looking after their two week old daughter, but when Alice Fancourt walks into the nursery, her terrifying ordeal begins, for Alice insists the baby in the cot is a stranger she's never seen before. With an increasingly hostile and menacing David swearing she must either be mad or lying, how can Alice make the police believe her before it's too late? And yeah, David basically becomes abusive in this, so um, trigger warning if for like spousal abuse, you know? And there's a little bit here which I found relatable, um, so... Uh, he's taking a whole month off work. He needs to prove to himself that being a bad father is not hereditary um, Which is something I feel like I need to prove to myself not that my dad was bad to all of his kids He just wasn't a particularly good father to me, but hey, -ho. I like this as well as one season succeeded another Charlie's legs turned from transparent to opaque and back again today. They were opaque yesterday. They've been transparent It was a sure sign that winter was on its way and I've like never noticed that before but that makes a lot of sense That's why you you know one of the perks of having a female writer is that you learn things like that about the the fairer sex. Couldn't she see the state he was in? Did she have any idea what it felt like to be so trapped in your own preoccupations that the d disapproval of others rolled off you like rain off the waxy bonnet of a car? Let me get. He came from a stable background, all right. Most people seem to think stable equaled happy. And um, also we get, he'd make his kids read the classics just as he had as a child. The lyrics of another 80s song, The Smiths this time, sprang to mind. There's more to life than books, you know, but not much more. I agree. And I like this. Just occasionally, the expression on Charlie's face when she said certain words reminded Simon of the class difference between them. There was a way of saying drug addict as if you'd never met one. As if the flawed and the weak belonged in a different universe. And Charlie's been sleeping around. Um, and Simon thinks he didn't like the thought of men mistreating Charlie. He couldn't understand why she allowed so many to use and discard her. She deserved better. He'd raised it once, tentatively, and she had pounced on him, insisting that she was the one who did the using and discarding, the one in control. Oh yeah, and then the main character is a homeopathist, and she's talking about the counselling component of her homeopathy training. And I'm like, well, that kind of devalues counselling to me, because counselling is a proven science and homeopathy is a load of bullshit. And we get Charlie drove like a man, steering with two fingers, or sometimes with her wrist, ignoring speed limits, swearing at other drivers. In that case, I guess I drive like a woman then, because I drive properly. You can't get too mad at that though, because insurers actually, like, if I were to get a car, one of the reasons I haven't is that my insurance premiums are more because I'm a man than if I'd been a woman, because men are proven statistically to be worse drivers. I like this as well. Weren't all perceptions of other people based on such inventions? Wasn't it crazy to assume that one's family, friends and acquaintances added up to coherent holes whose natures could be summarised and fixed? Most of the time, Simon felt more like a collection of random behaviours, each driven by an insane, anarchic compulsion he didn't entirely understand. And someone gets a, a book, an uncorrected bound proof, which I just thought was cool, a little insight into, you know, the publishing industry there. So Simon, he wonders why Alice hadn't simply prescribed herself a homeopathic remedy if she was nervous about giving birth. A perk of the job, he'd have thought, being able to cure oneself relatively easy and for no charge. Except, of course, homeopathy is a load of bollocks, which is probably why she didn't bother. Let me get this, which is interesting. Charlie had always mistrusted people who stayed chummy with their exes. It was unnatural, sick even, to tolerate the tepid, watered-down presence in your life of what was once love or lust. To save the detritus washed up after the wreckage of a romance and call it friendship. Simon was different. He was not Charlie's ex. He's my never-to-be, she thought sadly, and therefore much harder to get over. And so, um... What's her name, was it? Alice? Yeah, Alice. She, she goes, It's like me and homeopathy. I know the theories behind it and they sound like nonsense. You'd have to be a fool to believe that anything so outlandish could work. And yet it does. I've seen it time, time and time again. I trust it completely, even though logically it sounds like something I could never believe in. And I mean, that's the placebo effect, mate. Do people ever listen to placebo and think it's the cure? One of the characters says, And whatever any woman tells you, size does matter. That's, that's a lie, I hope. Sellers, whenever a woman, attractive woman crosses his path, he says, I've just had a visit from Captain Hardon. Let me, let me try saying that to my missus. I've just had a visit from Captain Hardon. And so we get this conversation between Charlie and Proust. So Charlie says, Alice Fancourt, on the other hand, I can imagine her taking a crazy risk like that. You can imagine, Proust sneered at Charlie. If I wanted to work with John Lennon, I'd hire a clairvoyant. She said, um, what? LMAO. 
Someone says, I'm not sure I believe in homeopathy. I read somewhere that homeopathic remedies are nothing more than pills of sugar dissolved in water. That if you did a chemical analysis of them, there would be no trace of any other substance. Yes, correct. And then Alice tries to defend herself by saying, what happens is that the more it's diluted, the stronger the effect becomes. I know it sounds unlikely, but experts are only just now beginning to understand exactly how homeopathy works. It's something to do with the original substance imprinting its molecular structure on the water. It has more to do with quantum physics than with chemistry. Isn't that a load of bollocks? said Laura. Isn't it true that what's really going on here this morning is that I'm going to hand over my hard-earned cash in exchange for a bottle of water? Yes, that is true. Dr. Allen says, I firmly believe that feelings are facts. No, that's not true. I feel like I'm the ghost of Abraham Lincoln. Not a fact. Oh, and she's being prescribed cocodamol as a painkiller. Um, and she decides to stop taking it because she needs a clear head. Oh, and then Charlie's trying to bait Simon into saying something. So she goes, she's, she goes, I bet she's got huge knocks and a nice tight fanny. And let's face it, Stacey's had two kids. Sellers probably flares around inside her like a pickled gherkin in a postman's sack. And David Fancourt's alibi is that he was watching The Mouse Trap, which I've been to see. I got very depressed for some reason. I think it was because it was my 30th birthday. We have a dog called Moriarty as well, which is a nice little Sherlock Holmes reference. Oh, so there's a reference to, uh, they, they find a kid who's wearing an M&M t-shirt, and I think, good taste, kid. And uh, Charlie asked, asks Simon if he's a virgin, and he still hasn't answered it. She hadn't repeated it. Was she trying to massage the facts in order to save her ego? She didn't think so. The more she examined her suspicion, the stronger it grew. It made perfect sense. Simon had never had a girlfriend, never mentioned past flings or serious relationships. Gibbs and Sellers were always saying he was probably one of those asexual people, like that comedian Stephen Fry. Or was it Morrissey? Well, Stephen Fry's married now. Stephen Fry's gay rather than asexual. I think he has a low sex drive, though. He has thought he was asexual at times. And uh, so we find out who the murderer is, and they go, uh, you've never stabbed a human being, so you can't possibly know how horrible it is. I wish I could forget what it felt like. You imagine it's going to be easy, like slicing a chicken breast, but it isn't. You can feel the texture of everything you're cutting through, the bone, the skin, the muscle, layers of resistance, and then the softness once you get through all that, the pulp. Mmm, delicious. So yeah, overall, little face by Sophie Hannah. I mean, there was a big twist at the end, which I saw coming after about page 30. Um, I didn't really like the character in it, so again, it was tough reading a lot of like the domestic abuse parts to it, but that was because of the context of the domestic abuse rather than because of any feeling I had for the character. Overall, I think it's probably Sophie Hannah's weakest, but if you're really into thrillers, you might enjoy it. I give it like a three out of five as I... So there we have it, that's what I made of Sophie Hanna, Little Face. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.